you will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once. Section 1 you will hear a telephone conversation between a man who works for a removals company and a woman who wants information about moving house. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. you will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon, Prime Removals. How can I help? I'm calling to ask about moving house. Certainly. The first thing I need to do is take some details. What's your name, please? It's Ellie Green. The woman's name is Ellie Green, so Green has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, Prime Removals. How can I help? I'm calling to ask about moving house. Certainly. The first thing I need to do is take some details. What's your name, please? It's Ellie Green. And can I have your phone number? It's 079-809-6774. Right. And could I have the address of the property you're moving from, please? Yes, it's 190 Beckett Court in Wandsworth. Can you spell Beckett for me, please? Sure. It's B E C K E T. Are you living in a house or a flat? It's a flat with two bedrooms, and we live in a tower block with ten floors. We live on the ninth. OK. So we'll need to take everything down in the lift. Let's talk about where you're moving to now. Whereabouts is that? It's a house, and it's in Finsbury Park. The new address is 18 Peel Crescent. OK. Well, let me tell you about the different removals options that we provide. The basic plan is the cheapest, and you need to have everything packed and all your furniture dismantled before we arrive then we can just move everything to your new home. OK. And um, what are the other options? We have another one called the Green Plan, which is eco-friendly. We lend you all the packing materials that you need, which are reused many times. You still have to pack everything, though. Hmm. That sounds good. And recycling is important to me, so I'll take the green one. OK. I'll make a note of that. Can you give me an idea about cost? Well, if we estimate the contents of a two-bedroom flat, I would usually say about £750. But as you're only moving a short distance, we could do it for about £650. Hmm. That would be fine. Thank you. I must stress, though, that's just an estimate, and the final cost will depend on any large or unusual items. Well, we do have some bulky items. The two beds, a couple of wardrobes, and, of course, there's a sofa in the living room. How about things in the kitchen? The fridge and cooker, for example? Those will be staying put, actually. We're renting this flat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, 
You have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you have any items that will need to go into storage? Um, we've got a lot of stuff actually. I think we'll have space for all our furniture, but we'll need to store our piano for a couple of months. We've got a lot of books too, but I think we'll have room for them. OK. I'll add the monthly storage cost when we provide the final quote. Thanks. We'll need to carry out a survey to see exactly what you've got. OK. I work from home most of the time, so it should be easy to arrange. Would the 1st of April at 11 in the morning be OK? Uh, yes, that's fine. Our doorbell isn't working at the moment, so you'll need to phone me when you arrive. Then I can let you in. OK. I'll make a note of that. Can you tell me about the parking situation where you live at the moment? Our building's set away from the road and there's plenty of parking available. Great. And what's the parking like where you're moving to? Hmm, not so good, unfortunately. People park on the street there and it can get quite busy. I see. Well, once we've confirmed the moving date, I'll get in touch with the council to reserve a space. Do you have a date in mind for the move? Yes. We're looking at the 17th of April. Hmm. That's a Friday, isn't it? Yes. I'm not sure that's a good idea. If there's any problem, then you may have to wait until Monday to deal with it. We recommend Thursday as the last day of the week to move on, so that would be the 16th of April. Well, I'll just need to confirm that with my husband, but I think it should be fine. OK, just let me know if there's any problem. Right. Well, thanks for your help. I'm really looking forward to... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear the manager of an urban farm giving a welcome talk to a group of visitors. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hi everyone. Welcome to Grantham Farm. Thank you all for coming to visit our urban farm today. My name's Linda and I'll tell you a bit about what we do before you head off to enjoy yourselves. To start with... I just want to mention our main objectives. We're a non-profit organisation and we began our work nearly 20 years ago with support from the local council. One of our key aims is to provide a safe, happy home for all the animals that you'll see here today. Many of them came to us because their owners couldn't look after them. Our other main job is to provide education about the environment and food. 
Our farm helps young people from city schools to learn about where their food comes from and to interact with animals, sometimes for the first time. We believe that this is really important. We can't go through life ignoring the natural world. We feel we deliver real value to the local community and we're very reliant on the support of our visitors in order to keep going. There are a number of ways that you can help us. Our animal sponsor scheme requires a small monthly donation of just one or two pounds. You can select an animal to support, which you can see whenever you visit, and you can watch them being groomed and fed by our staff. We'll also post updates and pictures for you to see on our social media pages. Another scheme is our allotment program. Local gardeners are invited to volunteer to help look after our vegetables, doing things like planting, watering or picking throughout the year. Of course, another way you can support the farm is by spending money in our gift shop. We sell a range of crafts and homemade products. Finally, in the past, we asked people to donate food for the animals. We had to stop doing this as we were given a lot of food that was unsuitable and we didn't want to waste it. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, let me tell you a bit about the attractions around the farm. Perhaps the most important thing to talk about first of all is our animals. We're home to more than 200 animals of all shapes and sizes, including chickens, ducks, rabbits, goats, cattle and sheep. Feeding the animals is a great opportunity for smaller kids and toddlers to learn about the habits of these creatures and how they live. And this is an activity that they can do almost every day of the year. If you're looking for something for older members of your family, we also provide horse riding lessons. These are suitable for children aged 12 and over. Currently, these aren't available year-round, I'm afraid. We can only provide them outside of school term time. We're very proud of our new learning area. Until this was built, we had a shortage of indoor space and we could only offer teaching in the summer when the weather was good. Now, however, we can provide talks, workshops and other educational activities all year round in our purpose-built classroom. We provide a wide range of courses to people of all ages. One of the most popular is the sustainability training course, which takes place in various locations both indoors and outside. This used to cost participants a small fee, but we've recently been given a government grant that allows us to provide these sessions at no cost. I'd advise you to book soon if you're interested, however, as places tend to fill up quickly. We're delighted to have the farmer's market here on Saturdays from 10 until 4 they used to come once a month, but we're very happy to welcome them every Saturday now. 
They offer a wide range of delicious products, so don't forget to come back and visit us then. Our cafe is also well worth a visit. Sue and her team cook some amazing vegetarian dishes, and you can enjoy one of their famous breakfasts six days a week. Local artists use the cafe as a place to exhibit their paintings. These are available for purchase, so why not go in for a coffee and have a look round? Okay, I won't keep you any longer. Have a great visit, and let me know if you have any questions. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two students on a teacher training course called Steve and Megan discussing a robotics club they are organising at a local school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Megan. Hi, Steve. How are you enjoying our teacher training course? Great, thanks. I'm really interested in the robotics club that our department head asked us to organise at the local high school. I'm just not sure whether we should limit which pupils can attend or open it to everyone. Well, I don't think it's practical to let all pupils at the school attend, but perhaps we could aim it at pupils who have chosen to study science at a higher level. What do you think? Hmm, perhaps. Or maybe we should restrict it to pupils in their final year. I think it'd be best for them, as some of the activities may be quite challenging. If it goes well, we could think about opening it to everyone sometime in the future. OK. We can see how it goes with a limited number, then consider making it bigger next term. So, the purpose of the club is to prepare for a national competition. Do you know any more about that? Yes, I've been working out the timetable, actually. When school starts again in September, will enter the pupils into a nationwide robotics competition. They'll spend the next six months building a robot and preparing. We'll need to have everything ready by the end of February. Then, in March, they'll take the robot to the event and compete against pupils from other schools. Great! Who is it that organises the competition? It's an educational charity, isn't it? It was originally set up by a charity, and there's some funding from the Ministry of Education, but nowadays it's run by volunteers. They are generally young people who competed in the event when they were at school. What about science teachers at the schools that take part? Do they get involved? I think they might help out with judging and so on, but they don't have time to organise it themselves. The one thing I'm not sure about is how much money we're going to need to run the club and what we need to raise money to pay for. It could be quite expensive to hire the tools we need. Hmm, 
I've spoken to the head teacher at the school, and she said they have a good stock of robotics tools in the science labs that we can use for free. That won't include electrical parts, though, such as batteries and switches and so on. So we'll need to spend a bit on that. Oh, that's good. And we've got plenty of books that we can let pupils borrow if necessary. So we won't need money for that. That's right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Are you? It'll be good to spend time with pupils and teachers who have the same appreciation for robotics and engineering that we do. Yes, me too. And I'm really excited about teaching teenagers too. Hmm. I'm a bit more nervous about that. I've done some teaching practice with younger children in the past, so this age group will be a challenge for me. I can't wait to get stuck into the building and engineering tasks, though. <laughs> I'll let you take the lead on that side of things. Then I prefer the planning and theory. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. I'm sure that this club is really going to benefit the pupils who join. I hope so. I think it's a really constructive way of spending their time, and I hope pupils will choose to come regularly each week. I think that just turning up week after week will lead to some of them becoming really engaged in engineering and electronics. Yes, I agree. I also think the pupils will need to design a robot that will be strong enough to survive the event. It also has to complete tasks quickly and accurately. Doing all of that will be a real challenge for them.、Mm, they'll have to solve many of the real-world problems that an engineering firm would encounter when producing their design. Building the robot will also be very beneficial to pupils, as it gives them the chance to apply what they've studied in the classroom to a practical project. That's right. Some of the restrictions on the size of the robot and the components that can be used mean that pupils have to work within clear parameters, which will be a challenge. Yes, but again, that's going to be helpful. As it'll get them used to dealing with limits that are imposed on them, I hope they'll enjoy taking part in the final competition. I'm sure they will. One great thing is the atmosphere at the event. Although it's a competition, teams usually help each other out. Between rounds, they lend each other spare parts and share advice. It all helps participants learn to cooperate with others. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture on urban planning about managing traffic congestion in cities. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Anyone who lives in or near a large city will be aware of the problems of traffic congestion. As cities continue to grow, so does traffic, with a number of negative effects. In this lecture, I'll talk about some of those effects and the measures that some cities have put in place to try to manage congestion. Managing traffic is a significant challenge for urban developers as congestion is widespread and has detrimental consequences on all our lives. Of those effects, perhaps the most impactful and common one is delays, mainly during the morning commute or on the journey home. These are unavoidable at busy times and stress is caused when travellers are unable to accurately estimate their journey time. Being caught in a traffic jam also influences the way that cars are driven. Drivers are likely to continuously brake, move a short distance and brake again. This stopping and starting way of driving uses more fuel than smoother driving, meaning that drivers pay more per journey. In addition, this type of driving leads to greater levels of pollution from cars' exhausts. Anyone who has driven through heavy traffic knows that it is not a calming or comfortable situation to be in, and unfortunately some drivers begin to be critical of other road users. There is a tendency to feel anger which can lead to people shouting at others, not paying attention and driving dangerously. This is a much more common reaction in traffic than on a quiet road. Another issue with traffic jams is that emergency vehicles, such as ambulances, may not be able to respond to calls quickly, bringing another threat to people's safety. So let's look at some specific examples of cities and the measures they've taken to address traffic congestion. First, I looked at Edinburgh in Scotland. In recent years, some studies have shown this to be the UK's most congested city, a problem increased by narrow roads in the centre and a large number of commuters coming into the city for work each day. Several measures have already been taken to improve traffic congestion in Edinburgh. Some of the busiest shopping areas in the city centre are open only to pedestrians, so cars cannot use these roads. Vehicles providing deliveries of goods to shops and businesses are permitted to access the area only in early morning or during the night. Alongside these traffic calming measures, there have been attempts to improve public transport in Edinburgh. A brand new tram network, which took six years to complete, is now up and running. Train stations have also been improved with larger platforms to accommodate more passengers and new routes. Another service enables travellers to check whether buses are running to schedule by downloading an app. Other cities around the world have introduced a range of measures to deal with traffic congestion and I'd like to highlight some of the most effective and interesting ideas now. Some cities are using technology in innovative ways. An example of this is Barcelona in the north of Spain, where officials in a control centre can monitor different aspects of traffic and parking in the city. On the busiest roads, cameras provide live information to staff at the control centre. They are then able to change the frequency of green traffic lights to help deal with congestion and to transmit information about parking availability via Wi-Fi. One of the most popular traffic calming schemes has been introduced in cities such as Stockholm in Sweden 
and London in the UK, where there's a charge to drive in the centre of the cities. This usually applies during the busiest times of day, and public transport, emergency vehicles, and eco friendly cars are exempt. This initiative reduces traffic and also raises money, which is invested in further transport improvements. In other cities, alternatives to cars are being promoted. And the most popular and efficient of these is the bicycle. The city of Hangzhou in China has an enormous bicycle rental scheme in which bikes are free for the first hour of use. They're easy and convenient to use and popular with tourists and commuters alike. In a clever move, the scheme is partly funded by revenue from sales of advertising. Which can be seen all over the hiring points. The last measure I'd like to draw your attention to is used on motorways in the UK and was first piloted around the city of Birmingham. The M42 motorway has to handle varying levels of traffic at different times of day. At peak driving times, the speed limit needs to be lowered. And in order for this to happen, there are signs over each lane relaying changing information to drivers. In this way, lanes can be opened and closed quickly, and speeds can be controlled in response to congestion or traffic incidents. Right, does anyone have any questions about what I've just That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.